Tomorrow is the title of my show of paintings here in Space K, Korea. There are 29 paintings in all, made over a period of about eight years I'd say, and there are at least 15 made specifically for this show. I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about my ideas, the catalyst behind the work, what drives me to make paintings such as these, and the way I put them together. There are three paintings in this show, three large recent paintings called Home 1, 2 and 3, and they were, they were painted just before I had to leave my London studio um, because of lockdown. And it wasn't until I got back to the studio in the summer that I'd seen I'd painted what we'd all just experienced, being stuck at home, uh, sitting out this, uh, this, this outbreak. And um, when I set out to paint these pictures, I wasn't entirely convinced about where I was going to go with them. I'd just completed a large, a large body of work, my breed, hoax and taxa, series of dead, dying flowers. And I was looking for a new, a new trope, a new language, a new setting for my works and uh, a new way in, a new way in. And so I began the works kind of as I, as I often do now with, with very large, very, very abstract, very fluid, open marks, very intuitive way of painting. And just to get something happening, just to get something fizzing on the surface, something that I can work with, uh, which I would then photograph and run through Photoshop. And uh, with the digital collage technique, I was able to sort of build, build some spaces of which, which brought me in, which, which, which inspired me somehow to, to populate or not populate uh, with, with various characters. And uh, the series seems to somehow evoke a loss, an emptiness, an entrapment, a claustrophobia. I, I, don't, I don't know what, and I don't really mind what you want to bring to the images because I'm not entirely sure myself, but I did feel that suddenly a place of comfort can sometimes become a place of discomfort and emptiness. And uh, also the, the, that feeling of, of invasion you can get when someone you've not invited is in, in your house. In Home 3 there are these figures in, in their protective clothing. Some event has happened in this space. I, mean, I think 1, 2 and 3 are possibly the same space. And uh, Home 3 is after the event. And Home 2, there's this young fellow in there. Is he, is he dancing in the space or, or is, he, is he having a psychotic episode? Possibly both. Uh, and he was the last, he was the last piece of painting I did, the very last day before the lockdown was announced. And I remember painting the hand on the figure, I think it was the last piece I did in that piece. And uh, then I had to um, pack what I could into the boot of my car and drive back home and set up camp, set up base camp in my spare room, which I continued painting in uh, for the next, next few months. And all of these works are made by a process of initial digital collaging of images which I collect and have here in my studio, uh, ostensibly um, second-hand books, magazines, and of course the internet of which we are all archaeologists of now. And uh, trawling through all these images and putting things together, cutting and pasting on the computer. Uh, multiple layering and uh, continued collaging as the picture progresses. So as I, I might paint for a, a day or two, photograph the painting, run it through Photoshop and add or edit and redact certain elements, then go back into the painting and uh, look, look for those little, little things that paint do, those little tricks, the things that trip you up and uh, make you reassess the work and go back in a different avenue you weren't initially expecting. And those little serendipities I'm always looking for and uh, flag up places I could, little avenues I could travel down, uh, dead ends I could fall into uh, and navigate my way out of again, of course. And that's the way my paintings tend to develop. My painting it is here, 
which was a title piece for a show I had in London a couple of years ago, was made about four years ago. And uh, it still troubles me, this painting, but troubles me in, in a good way. It um, shows a group of people around a tent outside. And in one reading, they could be having quite a jolly old time, but I suspect they probably aren't. Uh, I intended to make a picture about madness and ritual and humiliation. And also I was responding to, in a slightly obtuse, opaque manner, to, to the situation, the ongoing refugee situation that was happening and people escaping tyranny around the world and uh, how they were treated when they, when, if they were lucky enough to survive their journey, wherever they ended up. But these people are displaced and uh, are they having a party in this encampment they've washed up on? Are they being forced to dance for their gang masters? You tell me. Outlander and Tract are two large paintings that were painted maybe four years apart. And Tract was shown in New York in about 2012. And it's very much part of the series of works I was making with figures occupying dark woods and um, spaces people would find displaced from mainstream society. And I was very interested in these people out in the woods, scratching a life. And however much I speak about this narrative, this, uh, this idea behind the work, what kind of engages me about making painting is the setting up of a puzzle. So I might be presenting these characters doing what they're doing. Like here we have a, a young, young baby girl, maybe a father. Anyway, she's witnessing the father doing something strange. She's, he's been pushed to the side of the picture and she's watching something happening behind a pile of washing that's just been draped up or, or whatever. Maybe their camp's been raided, I don't know. But for me, I like setting up these questions. Uh, and then, then a bit slyly taking away, not, not giving the viewer everything. So the viewer has to come to the picture asking a lot of questions and not being given the answers. And that's something I really like doing, and uh, sometimes I'm criticised for that, making a work quite opaque and pulling away, pulling away the, the answers just when the, the viewer is starting to attach some meaning to the work. But for me, that means the work has a longevity and uh, in meaning, just in the way in Outlander, what's this figure doing? Is he walking towards you or walking away? You as the viewer are, are unable to interact you, you may, maybe you're witnessing something that you have an impotency. You, you cannot interfere with what's going here. Uh, well, I feel that anyway, and um, and I enjoy that. But also in this picture, I enjoyed inventing the colour. And a lot of the colour was coming from street protests and uh, street lighting, and also smoke flares, which is something I've been exploring quite a lot over the past ten years. Smoke bombs, whether it be. A uh, smoke bomb chucked into a football field or a smoke bomb thrown at a police line in a, in a riot. Uh, these social disturbances are, are an ongoing fact of life and I can't but, can't but help respond to it, but in a way that is not photojournalistic or reportage. It's a sensual response to something deeply troubling. Which is odd. But maybe that's what we do as artists. Seeing something uncomfortable, askance, bringing, bringing a sensuality to something that's actually deeply troubling. The largest picture in the show is called Zona, and it's a diptych which took a very long time to paint and started out as life being a response to um, race riots that we were witnessing in Missouri, in the United States. And the painting invariably ended up somewhere completely different. 
as always does with my work, it became a painting that to me now looking at it seems quite pagan, but also strangely prescient now that we're all so used to seeing people in full protective clothing and PPE and the whole, the whole visual lexicon we've all got used to seeing these sites. And, uh, and I say pagan because for me, these, these characters in the painting exist in the spirit world or another dimension. They, um, they don't seem real to me. In fact, there's a conversation going on between them that is um, not particularly comfortable. There's, uh, there's power being exerted by that main figure. I mean, whatever this figure represents, I suppose will always remain un unknowable. But uh, whatever, whatever you think, it's, it, it's certainly applicable for, for now. Well, that's for sure. Odessa started out as a bit of a response to, to, to war and uh, corruption I was seeing all over the media. And it's, it's unclear what's happening. On some level, it looks like a fantastic party that's gone incredibly badly wrong. On the other level, it's, it's a collaged psychodrama. It's a surreal, surreal vision. And similarly, Slinter exists in this liminal space between the real and the imagined. And there's a figure in scene glimpsed through this, this fog of colour and spattered paint. And it looks to me like this person may be uh, either saving some kind of archive or his library, or even involved in the destruction of information. Uh, the books are, are possibly being burned, and there's another figure just glimpsed off on the right. There's a, there's a clue of a figure just off stage, if you like. And uh, both these figures could be culpable in this destruction. I mean, Slinter is an out-of-view slang word now, but it, but it, it suggests a liar. And, uh, yeah, is this picture about dissemination of false information, the destruction of real, cherished knowledge? I mean, I painted it at the time of Trump's inauguration. Uh, make that whatever you will, but uh, it was certainly an experimental... Uh, Experimental canvas for me at the time with the colour and the approach of the paint and the, the spattering of the paint and the, the, free, the free paint involved with the quite descriptive marks as well. But uh, I, I'm, I'm glad to see it in the show. There are three landscape paintings in the show that uh, are quite conventional in approach really. Um, I was thinking a lot at the time of uh, Dugas' uh, horse race paintings and the way the horses occupied a space, but this space was actually quite um, comprehensible and you could understand where you were as a viewer in the space. And I like the way you could see, uh, see 19th century industrialised suburbs sort of glittering away in the background in, the, in this French light. and. Uh, and I was also at the same time looking at photographs I'd taken on a visit to Switzerland of this fantastic mountain in um, the canton of Glarus. And uh, I was thinking about how this landscape I'd been in in Switzerland was just this most idyllic, beautiful space. And I was wondering what it'd be like to, to, to subvert that. <laughs> and, um, you know, being, being the person that I am. And uh, I was thinking about how could I make some kind of intrusion into this beautiful space, this, this cherished space? And uh, for me, it was the, um, the nightmare of these figures I have. I mean, one, one painting um, has a figure in it that you might recognize from my large painting, Home 3. And it's something I like to do. I, li I like to try out my characters in, in, in different environments and, and see, it, see how they feel and fit in this space and, and what, I, what I feel about it and how I respond into it. But to me, um, this idyllic dream space, that this, this beautiful mountain, the air, is, has been poisoned and corrupted by, by the intrusion of, of these figures which I've put into the, the space. Um, so there you are. Uh, 
the beauty has been corrupted yet again. And, <laughs> and I guess I'll be continuing to do that for a few more years yet. My ongoing series of paintings called Cult all came about from finding this most fantastic book in a second-hand bookshop many years ago and it was all about um, techniques of plaster of Paris uh, in, the in the treatment of gunshot wounds that GIs had received in World War II. And I loved the way these black and white photographs, very grainy black and white photographs, uh, displayed these men's arms, these shattered limbs, as these strange enveloped sculptural shapes, these forms uh, with, with their accoutrements of, of cat gut and, and um, metal coat hanger wire and toothpicks and matchsticks, whatever, hold, holding their hands in traction depending on what, whatever uh, bone had been shattered or whatever. And uh, I, I found these pictures kind of deeply moving. It took me a long time to work out how to deal with them and my, my way in to deal with them was to approach them as as sculpture, as still life. Quite a formal display of these limbs rather than putting them into some kind of story or some kind of narrative. And of course this is exacerbated by this rather odd space I've put them in. I've presented them against these colours and shapes inspired by a quick Google search I did on broken plasma TV screens. And this was a few years back before I'd even started to work on my more uh, loosely based way of painting backgrounds. And I was looking for some kind of abstract language and I came across this abstract language from, the, from these shattered pixels. And this was way before I'd ever heard about glitch glitch imagery which is something you can look, look up on the internet apparently all the kids are into and I had no idea about this whatsoever anyway that, that's part of the course um, but uh, what was really important that I discovered when making these these pictures was because I'm working from a, quite a bad quality photograph and quite a banal image used purely that was made purely for instructional use uh, they're not things of beauty but within them I winkled out what I thought was beautiful in, in, in these pictures. And through the very act of, of scrutinising the paintings, uh, scrutinising the photographs in fact, and, and looking at the, the, the person's actual hand covered by all this plaster, the broken fingernails, the, the hairs on the thumb or what, what, what have you, the, these, these clues revealed to me the real person inside this. and it, and through the very act of looking, deconstructing and then reconstructing the image through making the painting, I, I was making this connection with, with, the huma with, the, with the humanity in this image, the person, the actual person this event happened to uh, 80 years ago. And uh, I, had this com I had this connection straight away through, across those years, like you do when you're painting a, a live person, when you're painting their portrait in front of you, there, there's this connection through even through this very opaque, broken imagery, I found this connection, this compassion. And uh, I, I found that quite moving. And I, through looking at these photographs, um, the humanity is there for me, as fresh as the time when that photograph was taken. However, however strange the architecture of the pictures looked like or the, the fact they presented very much like a still life or a sculpture, for me it's the fact that this happened to a person. And I'm, I can't help but feel compassion for this person. My series of seven untitled head paintings were made um, in my lockdown studio, which was basically my small spare room at home. I had to move out of my South East London studio. I wasn't allowed to travel there, obviously. And um, I wanted to make work that responded to the ongoing situation. So uh, being aware that I'm an artist who is known for painting 
hazmat suits and protective clothing. I wanted to do something else. I felt unable to, to make work as, as explicit as that. So I wanted to find some kind of solution to what I was feeling at the time. And I suppose it was during the environment when the media was full of all these stories of people being unable to, to literally touch their loved ones who were being so ill in hospital. And so I started painting these portraits with hands, these gestures coming in to the small pictorial space. And I felt somehow there was a very disconnected sense between these protagonists. There's people are literally reaching out, but somehow there's a there's a disconnect. And I pursued that for seven pictures and they became it became a successful series of work right up until the time I actually stupidly broke my own hand during lockdown. So I found myself in A and E talking to the doctors and nurses and various technicians who were sorting out my shattered metacarpals. And this is my painting hand we're talking about here, so I had to suddenly stop this series of work and start working left-handed, but that's a that's another story. But I was just I couldn't believe the irony of sitting in this hand trauma unit in the middle of a COVID outbreak in a in a very big London hospital, talking to the people who are treating me. And being explicitly told about the tendons and metacarpals and bones and whatever, whatever, whatever in my hand, having spent months and weeks looking at photographs of others, other people's hands and getting to understand the structure of hands and the way skin moves over tendons and muscle and bone. Yeah, there's some irony there. And during my own period of recuperation, I was having to teach myself to paint left-handed, which I thought would be, would be okay, was in fact was fantastically difficult. But I have to say, I was fascinated how neural pathways would, be, would, be, would, would grow and connect over just practicing painting. And I made about, um, about 15 paintings whilst my hand was uh, healing. And uh, I'm happy to say um, two did actually make it to the show. And there were two studies there and one of which actually made the poster for the show, so that's pretty fantastic. Uh, but because I wasn't able to use my, my computer, I, I literally couldn't use a mouse um, or my, my stylus or whatever, uh, I went through my, my archive of, of these digital collages that I make, these actual pieces of paper, and I was going through hundreds and thousands of these images, and I just wanted to uh, reappraise um, some working documents that I'd made for some of the other paintings in the show, most explicitly uh, uh, Zona, the diptych. And uh, I made some studies of that with my left hand and found that um, my lack of control and finesse, which of course one spends decades building up, were, were, were totally gone. And I had to, had to let the paint do its own thing and uh, let, let the medium do what it does without any particular strong input from me and that that was that was a learning curve and in fact it's something people have been telling me for years Justin just do something to upset this this thing you're always doing start painting left-handed so I quite literally did and uh, now that my hand is healed I'm thinking maybe I will go back to using my left hand and become maybe a kind of an ambidextrous type of painter could be really interesting I mean, I would say when reviewing my work, a lot of it is to do with what it is to be human and navigating ourselves through this crazy world we're inhabiting at the moment. I mean, there's all this white noise of, of rubbish and stupid paranoid fairy tales that are threatening us all around and, and it's seeping deep into our consciousnesses. So how can I not, as a figurative painter, try to comment, to dig out some kind of nugget, an essence, something of substance that is meaningful to me and hopefully be able to communicate something of that to you? I mean, here we have my interest in, in collage, figures that are disjointed, the environment they inhabit is fractured, the narrative is muddied and opaque. I mean, for me, I'm trying to deal with all this racket of anxiety around us. How can I not make figurative works without responding to all this anxiety, this disquiet? How can I not?